All right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, we're excited today to present to you the 2014 Belize Geoscience Exchange Study Abroad Program in Geographic Information Systems, uh, hosted by the Department of Geosciences. Um, I'm Tim Hawthorne. I'm one of the co-program directors for this program. And I'm Christy Basaji, the other program director. And we're excited today to celebrate with all of you, uh, both here in Atlanta and also for those of you watching on the live feed or the archive feed um, in Belize and around the country, um, the work of these 12 amazing students. We have 11 students from Georgia State University. We have one student that also joined us from The Ohio State University as well. And I think one of the real strengths of this program is it's very um, much across many disciplines. It's not just a geosciences course. Um, as you'll see today, our students are from very different, very diverse disciplines on campus, and that, I think, makes for a much stronger program at the end of the day. So we're really excited to celebrate that diversity and also to celebrate the diversity of skill levels within the class. We have everyone from Johnny here, who's a freshman, all the way up to Nate, who is a PhD student as well. So we, we sort of span the gamut of the experience here at Georgia State, which I think is another real asset of this program. So today we're here to celebrate the work of our students and to celebrate the work of our Belizean collaborators as well, because um, as you'll see today, this is a very collaborative research experience um, as part of our study abroad program. So I think we just wanted to start um, by sort of giving you a vision uh, of, of how uh, Dr. Passaggi and I sort of conceptualized this in the last couple years as we, as we move forward and apply for funding and sort of think about uh, the classroom structure as well. And I think really at the end of the day, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the GSU strategic plan. Um, we fit really nicely into um, the idea of globalizing the university and creating more globally aware, globally minded citizens and student researchers as well. Um, so we're trying to create globally aware student researchers that are committed to applying geospatial, geographic information system skill sets and other STEM related research skills into the applied real world community based research setting. Um, and by doing that, one of the hallmarks of this program is we're trying to enhance and integrate our work into existing collaborations within, within the nation of Belize. So as you'll see today in the presentations, a lot of our work is very much focused on working with entities within the national government, research entities at the University of Belize, and also, um, importantly, local organization and local school districts as well, um, and also local residents and tour guides. Um, and that, I think, is one of the real strengths of what, we, what we're trying to do. Thirdly, we're trying to develop a new sort of conceptual and methodological framework for doing this kind of work, especially within the geosciences. Surprisingly, geosciences, particularly geography, um, there's not a whole lot about um, this type of approach being written in the study abroad research literature. Um, so we're excited to be able to sort of share some of these lessons learned in scholarly publications and also in research presentations like this and others at national and international conferences. And then finally, we're working um, with the college and with Ashley Mastin to develop um, our, our final agreement to work um, on an exchange program between the University of Belize and also Georgia State students. Um, so far, we've been really lucky. We've been able to send many students abroad in this program, but also we've been able to send two of our students abroad to do extended field work. One, Paulita Ben Martin, as a senior honors student funded through the Honors College and the Department of Geosciences. And then the second, Craig Skelton, one of my thesis, uh, MS thesis students in geosciences, he completed his thesis field work funded by the, the geosciences department in Belize as well. So here are a few quick accomplishments of some of the work that we've done so far in the last three years. Uh, as Tim mentioned, uh, we are a kind of unique study abroad experience covering many disciplines within the framework of GIS and apparently the only one focused on community geography and GIS in the world. Uh, 51 students so far have been sent to Belize as part of our Maymester course program these past three years. Tim just mentioned the two students that have done uh, additional work there as part of thesis research. And the multi-disciplines, as we mentioned before, not only do we have students from freshman to PhD, but also from biology to psychology to geosciences uh, to public health and beyond. And I think the final two point, points I think are extremely important to keep in mind here as well. We're, we're, we sort of go beyond the traditional study abroad model and we really want to focus on the research experience and all parts of the research experience. So actually collecting the data, conceptualizing the results, and then finally presenting the results. 
And I think so far this program, even though it's still in its early stages, it's been incredibly successful in publishing and also in getting students to international conferences. So, so far we've got two outstanding publications with um, student co-authors from the first couple years. The first is, a, is an article in the Journal of Geography and Higher Education, written with one of our master's students from the first year in the program, and that focuses on the model of community engagement in GIS scholarship in a study abroad program, which is sort of the first of its kind written within the geography journals um, that we know of. The second paper, which we're really excited about, um, that you'll see a little bit in one of the presentations today, is in the Annals of the Association of American Geographers, which is essentially our premier flagship journal within our discipline. That, too, has a student, master student co-author as well. We're very excited about that. And that focuses on the idea of sort of um, thinking about critical reflection in study abroad, because we know that study abroad is such a powerful experience for students. It's a challenging experience. It's chaotic. And um, a lot has been written about that within the literature, but not so much has been written about how all of those emotions, all of those reflections are connected to actual geographic locations. So um, with our students here, um, with our former program director, Dr. Chris, At Chris, Chris Atchison, and also our colleagues um, at the University of Panama and the Association of American Geographers, we developed a, a methodology called critical reflection mapping that combines the highlights of critical reflection journaling with actual mapping and field data collection. And so we have two case studies in that paper, one focusing on Belize, one focusing on their work in Panama. Um, and it's a really cool project. You'll see a little bit more um, adaptation of that in one of the presentations today. So we're really excited about that as well. Then the final point is um, we've had the great opportunity to send quite a few of our students to international meetings and conferences, including one in Belize. Um, so that's something we want to continue to, to keep going. So for the 12 of you in this room right now, again, as we said on the trip, we welcome the opportunity to go with you and, and send you to conferences, uh, both here in the States and potentially in Belize and other spots around the world as well. And our students have also presented at GSERC on campus as a result of the research that they did in Belize. So you've heard me talk, many of you have heard me talk about this idea of community geography and GIS. And I just wanted to sort of summarize that really briefly, especially for our, our live feed audience as well. The idea here and the model that we put forth is not just going abroad, visiting the sites, and doing some sort of work that come back and you present to us. That's not what we want to do. We want to create work that is beneficial to Belizeans, that sort of incorporates their knowledge and incorporates their partnerships in our, our research agendas as well. And we want to create these shared research agendas, particularly focused on the idea of citizen science and community engagement. Um, because I think there's a really strong literature out there that suggests that local knowledge and, and people that live in a particular location know the most about their location. So we want to harness that, um, and you'll see that repeatedly in the four presentations today, the idea of the importance of local knowledge, the importance of the Belizean experience coming into GIS. So um, instead of going online and getting all this great GIS data about Belize, going to Belize, working uh, with Belizeans as well. And I think the second point here is that you're going to see repeatedly throughout these talks that there's a huge emphasis on mixed methods and multiple types of data. So a lot of people think of GIS and mapping as extremely quantitative. However, I think what you'll see from the presentations today is the mix of both the quantitative and the qualitative, especially when you think about people's perceptions of spaces, the emotions of doing a study abroad research experience as well. And then finally, we're obviously, as a geography and GIS focused class really focused on spatial thinking, trying to figure out geographic awareness, trying to harness the power of mapping and spatial awareness to understand local knowledge, particularly from the Belizean stakeholder experience as well. So we have a few examples to mention briefly here of projects that we've worked on with some of our collaborators in Belize over the past few years. Uh, the first is marine debris mapping that we did with Ocean Academy this year, as well as surveying the residents of Key Cocker. So you'll hear a little bit more about that today, but basically this type of project is a great example of how research is conducted through a service learning experience as part of uh, the GIS course. Also marine biodiversity mapping. Uh, Belize has the second largest barrier reef in the world, um, but it is under threat through a number of uh, disturbances, natural as well as man-made. So we have a really unique experience here where students are collecting 
GPS data using kayaks, snorkeling, recording information about the biology of the reef, and you'll learn a little bit more about that this afternoon as well. We've done this uh, with some of the local boat captains and resort staff in Belize. And then this data is going into a citizen science uh, global database called Reef uh, that monitors fish populations around the world. The, the final two projects, um, one of the original projects that we started with when we started this program in 2012 was focused on agricultural mapping. So we've continued that theme throughout the past three years. The first two years we focused on the banana industry, which is a huge industry within Belize. And with that, we, we partnered with the Belizean um, national government, including the Ministry of Natural Resources and Agriculture, and also their GIS operations centered under the Land Information Center. Um, and then last year, um, when we did this, we focused again on banana mapping and also on some of the other farms um, outside of San Ignacio and integrated students from the University of Belize as well, which was a really nice addition to that particular project. And then this year, as you'll see in one of the presentations from one of the groups, we focused on the sugarcane industry, working again with University of Belize students, local farmers, and also um, CIRNI, the Sugarcane Industry Research and Development Institute for Belize as well. So you'll hear more about that um, later this morning. And then finally, we've talked a lot about sort of planning and open space management, particularly in the last, um, the first two years, where we worked in the town of Dangriga with the town council, um, with local planners, local residents, and also the Land Information Center again, to understand their land use planning, trying to get their, um, their records that are sort of in you know, traditional paper format, trying to get that into a digital format to make better land use planning decisions as well. So um, that work has been extended, particularly with our student Craig Skelton and his thesis work as well. So before um, we end this particular introduction, I wanted to quickly acknowledge uh, many people that have made this possible. And I think first and foremost, we want to thank the Department of Geosciences and our chair, Dr. Dandy Ocampo, who will be joining us later, um, and also our former chair, Dr. Crawford Elliott. Um, they have been tremendous supporters of this work, um, allowing us to create a model that we're excited about, we're passionate about, believing in this model that's sort of a, a bit unconventional. So we really thank them for their support, especially the financial support they've provided for our student researchers and for our additional planning trips as well. Um, secondly, he just walked in uh, thanking Jeremy Billadu and his staff and the Study Abroad Office for believing in what we do and in, in continuing to support us, um, answering our countless emails and, and things like that um, as well. So we're extremely grateful for that support. Um, also, um, Ashley Mastin and Gail Nelson from the College of Arts and Sciences, the International Programs Division, really um, have been great, especially in crafting the um, collaborative agreement with the University of Belize as we work through the kinks of that. Um, they've been also very supportive of the work as well. And then finally, uh, Dean Berman, Associate Dean Cook in the Honors College for their tremendous support as well. They've um, helped fund particularly Paulita's work um, in her senior honors thesis, and we're looking forward to continuing that research um, and education partnership for them as well. And, and just excited to be able to contribute to the growing Honors College also. Um, also, another person who's not here, he's leaving for the University of Cincinnati, um, to take a new faculty position, Dr. Chris Atchison, our pro one of our co-program directors from year one and year two. Um, he's been extremely helpful to the development of this collaboration as well, um, and we wish him well as he, he moves on to the University of Cincinnati. Um, and then finally, I would be remiss if I didn't also thank Dr. Basaji, um, who I'll tell a quick funny story, um, and she'll laugh at this too. The way this whole, this whole thing started, she came on an interview, this class had been sort of in development for a year with me and Atchison. And uh, on the interview, I said, hey, do you want to go to Belize? Because I had read her CV, looked at it, and she's like, what? This guy is crazy. And I said, well, I just want to go snorkeling, and I want to do it for academic credit. And as a marine biologist, that was like the joke. And then it became a bigger discussion about how we could do research. And then, as you're going to see today, it really turned into a really cool opportunity where students are out kayaking on the reef, snorkeling on the reef, and we're collecting some really cool data that can, as she said, um, get into that global uh, reef database as well. So I'm really excited um, that she's a part of this program as well, and we're excited to continue it as we move forward in the future. The final thing I'll say <laughs> as an acknowledgement is related to the funding structure of this, this program. I think um, one of the things that I really like to stress about this work is these students are amazing. The 51 students that we've taken across these three years, they're doing this 
in extremely challenging conditions, right? Study abroad is emotionally, physically, every sort of emotion you can think of, it's challenging in every way. You have to live with a roommate you may not like every day, right? You're working 14, 16 hour days mainly. I mean, we work you pretty hard. Um, so I thank them for the spirit that they bring to this. I, I can tell you that this group, I've never seen a group laugh more in challenging conditions as they, as they created some really awesome work. So I thank them for that. Um, and also recognizing that we're doing all this on a very small budget. This isn't funded by a big NSF grant right now. We're working on that. But right now this has been supported just through study abroad student tuitions, a very small research grant from the International Strategic Initiative, and then also some support from Geosciences and the Honors College. So we, we hope that we can reach new heights with this program as we continue to go after external funding as well, um, particularly from the National Science Foundation. So I'll stop. That's all I want to say. Do you have anything else to add? Well, I was just going to say also to thank all of our collaborators and please for all the work um, that they've done so far and the projects in development as well as the um, program that you're working on to bring students from Belize to Georgia State University. So I think we may say a little bit more about that at the end, but uh, just get it started. And thank you for inviting me into this opportunity. All right, so we now let the students go. Yeah, let's go <laughs> to the fun stuff now. So we're going to start with uh, the first of four presentations. Um, so if the first group could come on up. Hello, everybody. So we're um, going to talk to you guys about examining students' socio-spatial perceptions in Dangriga, Belize. Um, I'm Leah Scott. I'm Tara Mitchell. Okay. So first, let's start with a little background about Belize. Um, so Belize is a very small country. It's actually smaller than the state of Massachusetts, but it's very diverse because it takes in a lot of migrating population. In terms of um, its history with power and control, it was actually controlled by, um, it was a colonial British power for a very long time. They didn't gain their independence until 1981. And um, essentially, they didn't see it as a very viable area. It didn't have much of a population, but it has a great um, ecosystem. So even though they got their independence in 1981, um, British troops still remained in Belize till 1993. And then as we learned when we were there, there's still a lot of uh, disputes with Guatemala. If you look at this map, the yellow portion shows you um, areas that Guatemala still may want to claim as theirs. And if you look right here, it's Sand Creek. Our study area, Dangriga, is included in that. So if something like this were to happen, then obviously we wouldn't have an area to study. So in terms of Dangriga, it's called the cultural capital of Belize. It is the third largest town in, Dang in Belize. And it's very well known for its Garifuna culture. And here's some people in traditional garb. So I'll be talking about the importance of tourism in Belize. Um, in Belize, tourism is the number one foreign exchange earner. Um, many of the um, money that's coming into the country is due to the tourism that's going throughout um, either the Mayan area, seeing the Mayan ruins, uh, through the dive areas. There's also a rich ecosystem there. So it brings a lot of people into the country to be able to snorkel, fishing, um, a lot of things that have to deal with the biodiversity of the ocean in Belize. Um, a lot of the tourism industry is made up of expatriates that have decided to move into the country. This has also been a big, um, well, it has been it has affected the economy there because it's also a place where people who don't live in the country are able to um, buy land. And most of the land there is available for 
a reduced amount of money in which a lot of people um, enjoy being able to buy land off of the um, off of the ocean and um, not having to pay the um, the cost of you know beachfront property. So what we were doing within our research is critical mapping. In critical mapping, um, there is a sketch mapping that is done of the location in which the person is in and how it is that they're actually feeling at that time, using re um, critical reflection on your um, sense of being within that area. So within our project, we didn't use sketch mapping, but we used GPS points to be able to pinpoint where exactly that location is what the land use of that area is, and how is it that a person would feel in that area. Do they feel safe? Um, are they feeling um, any kind of way towards the environment? Are they feeling happy? Those are things that um, we can use within the criti critical reflection um, mapping. So GIS is connected um, with map GIS demonstrates a clear connection between mapping and methods to represent people, places, and processes, meaning how is it that a land mass and ge geographical area can actually affect how a person is feeling. Um, this generates and deepens and documents learning with using the critical reflection and how it is that people can, um, how it is that people's emotions can affect their surroundings and how that surroundings can affect a person's um, emotional state of being. So our research question was using critical reflection mapping, where do people, um, well it will also be uh, us as students, feel um, safe, where do we feel happy, how are we feeling within Belize as first time um, students being in that country? and specifically in Dangriga. Okay, so our intended audience for our map and research were tourists and they know what, what areas to visit, which places people like the most, and also what areas to avoid. Um, another audience is qualitative geographers. This is a fairly new field of research, not that many people have done this. Um, and the local governments. Tourism is very important to their economy, so they need to know what places people really like to go, and what places they need to improve on. So our data collection methods, um, we are told to go to 15 locations. There are five specific locations that everyone visited. Those are the health clinic, Mr. Rodriguez's drum shop, the drum for our father's statue, the main fishing dock, and the outdoor market. And we are told to take a point at each of those places and then write down a dominant emotion or a feeling that we felt at those points. So, um, the goal of this was to uh, quantify qualitative data. So try and connecting an emotion to a specific point. So we coded the emotions into positive, neutral, and negative emotions. And we kind of talked to each student um, they wrote down one word and then kind of talked to each student about why they wrote down that word to see if they felt positive, negative, negatively, or neutral. So our data sources were the GPS points collected from each of the students. Um, we used the base maps from, RTA, from RTAS and the Biodiversity Environmental Research Data System. Um, and some of the collection issues we had were some of the emotions were kind of hard to fit in these three distinct categories. And often students wrote down a state of being rather than an emotion. So we got a lot of hungries, um, not really emotions. Um, so we could do some improvement on that. Okay. So we <coughs> coded the emotions into those three separate areas and created a new layer for each of those emotions. Um, so for each of those, we created a 100-foot buffer around those points. Um, and then we used land use data to connect certain emotions to certain land uses. So then we used a select by location to intersect the positive buffers 
with the land use. And then from there, we use the intersect tool to intersect those specific land use parcels that were selected and the buffers. So a word cloud was used um, within our study to be able to qualitatively show and map actually words and emotions. That's something that's new to the field, something that Dr. Hawthorne has worked really hard on. And, um, and here's an example of all the data that we collected of how people were feeling at the time and how you can visibly see it within a map of where and how people were feeling when they were in Dangriga. Okay, so here's our map showing um, the places that people felt positively and we found that most people felt a positive emotion when they were in the residential areas. And to connect to that map, we have our word map. Um, we used um, wordle.net um, which actually I inputted all the information on, all the positive feelings that were felt um, throughout the, um, the study. And the larger the word is, the more prevalent it is and um, that people were feeling. So of course, a lot of people were feeling happy, a lot of people were feeling nostalgic as they walked through the, the town. Um, and the smaller words were more individualized. that most students felt negative emotions when they were around areas that are classified as vacant. Okay. And then we also did a density analysis to just see how big where students felt negatively. So we have, this was Mr. Rodriguez's drum shop um, and the fishing dock in the outdoor market. So in those areas, um, one of the problems that we were saying that we had with the data was that people were not only saying emotions, but they were also giving states of being. So hungry is the <laughs> largest one that we have, but that is due to, um, you know, once again, very long days, um, a lot of activities that we were doing. So I think hunger was on a lot of people's mind at the time, not necessarily emotions. but. Um, things like weird, disgusted, those things kind of we can pinpoint to where those were at the fishing dock where a lot of the fish were being cleaned at that time. Um, and awkward and things like that were kind of uh, felt in uh, Mr. Rodriguez's jump, drum shop just because he was closing and there were a lot of students coming by at different random times. So here's an example of the neutral feelings that were felt um, as the students explored Dangriga. And once again, we can see how um, using the qualitative um, word mapping, you can see the um, trends, interested, confused, curious, intrigued, all those things were felt um, predominantly during that time. So Besides using the word cloud, we wanted to do it in a more quantitative way, so we also put our data into SPSS to see the frequencies of words being used. So at each of the five locations we had to visit, which Mary mentioned before, see market had the most people felt confused, but it was only two, two people. Rest were usually only one person felt that emotion. They were pretty individualized. Um, at Jumps of Our Fathers, it was interested. At the drum shop, it was awkward. Um, at the fishing dock, it was disgusted and hungry, tied at three. Um, at the clinic, it was happy. And then, of course, can go to the, next one. the most common emotion um, felt was happiness. That was felt at least 19 times, I believe, by students. So once again, these are the, the feelings associated with the locations that we were required to visit. Um, we have some limitations in our study. These are advantages and disadvantages to critical reflection, not critical reflection mapping. In terms of the individual, individual, there are some advantages. It's not a threatening situation. Um, you can be more honest with yourself, but there's also a disadvantage where you may not choose to be more honest with yourself. Um, there's no check and balance, I guess, in that situation. Um, you only have one world perspective to look at when you're only look, considering yourself. And then you can also become negative. When you keep reflecting, constantly reflecting, you may turn into more negative reflection. Um, in terms of a group, um, an advantage is that there's many world perspectives you can gain from the people you're walking around with. 
um, but it also may cause collusions rather than challenging critical reflection, which can become a problem. Um, another limitation of our study in particular was the fact that we were kind of on a time constraint. We were really kind of exhausted. I believe we just got off a bus in the morning and we were trying to beat the sun by going to visit these five locations and then get 10 more in a new place. So that may have caused some errors in data. Um, we're also limited by the student data in terms of what we mentioned before. A lot of times states of being were written down rather than emotion. Um, so that kind of causes some errors in the data. Also with accuracy of GPS points when you're mapping things, you want to make sure everybody's taking the points for say the drum shop in the same place or in the drums of our fathers. It was a really large um, area around the statue, so someone could have taken the point right in front of the statue. Someone could have taken the point from far away and say, hey, I see drums of our fathers. So that may cause error in our data. Also, we kind of collected our data on two streets. So if we had more data spread out throughout the town, we could have had better density models. Um, one future direction we considered was maybe using a word bank, even though that may become restrictive and limiting, because you don't want to limit someone's emotions, but if you hopefully can create something large enough or create more options for them to choose from that may be something that would give you more accurate data. Um, another limitation that we came across um, was, um, was a take of preparing students for self-evaluation. Being able to sit down with the students and really let them know that it's important to be able to look within, be able to feel what you're feeling in that, in that area, and be able to vocalize or be able to write down what it is that you're actually feeling. I think that would have helped our data a lot if we had time to actually critically process what it is that we were feeling in each location instead of having to rush to each place to beat the sun um, to get back to our hotel. So we would like to thank Dr. Hawthorne and Dr. Visaji. We would also like to thank the, um, the Study Abroad Office for not only the opportunity of Georgia State students, but also students from other universities to be able to participate in this study. Thank you. So uh, I will kick off questions if you don't mind, because I was not part of this particular project. Uh, I'm not sure how much you talked about with Dr. Hawthorne from the previous work you did in Gandriga in terms of um, planning of space in that area as they want to grow as a tourist center. So what do you think we can do with these data in speaking with our collaborators in Gandriga? You know, what, what is the utility of this particular data set in their thinking ahead? Town. So from this data we can identify what places people really like to visit and the kind of places where people felt awkward or didn't really like. So they can try and improve the places that people didn't really like and identify their strengths and what really works for their town. Any other questions? So my question is, um, in sort of thinking about this idea, um, how how it might work if you were doing this? Let, let's say UB students were working with this. How do you how do you think it would be um, as university lead research students doing this versus you doing it? What do you think the opportunities and challenges would be of, of working with these different types of data sets? So I think in terms of looking at it from a tourist perspective. UB students are not going to give you that tourist perspective because they most likely understand the country or comfortable in the country. Whereas when you're a tourist, you don't know where you are. Like we were, this was our first time actually in the city, first time walking around to see everything, except for one student who had actually lived in Belize. Um, so in terms of that, you're going to get different perspectives. So you can separate it, but I don't think you'd be able to create something joint that would provide that tourist perspective using native students and using non-native students. I also think that it would add to the dialogue between um, the students um, in the University of Belize and also the um, students from abroad, being able to come together and hash out some of the differences that we might see in one place. One place might seem wonderful to the students of Belize, but to tourists, it may seem a little, a little hesitant to be in that area. 
So a lot of it can um, really be discussed. Some, some things as far as stereotypes, some things as far as um, just cultural differences can be talked about on an open, um, an, like an open floor. And I think a lot of things would help as far as us becoming global students, uh, global ambassadors for Georgia State, um, being able to have that open mind and be able to talk globally about things that are different and outside of our country. And that's what's great about this methodology, this critical reflection mapping, is that it opens those doors for dialogue. That seems like it's part of its purpose in using this methodology. You want to open those doors, create those discussions. Any other questions? I was really intrigued by the idea of critical reflection, uh, but I was also curious about your methodology and objectivity and subjectivity and how that might creep into uh, the critical reflection. I noticed when you went through the categories and you identified positive words, negative words, and neutral words, it seemed like in each category there might have been a word that could have been construed as maybe not belonging to that category. So can you tell me, did you, how did you come up with the decision to classify a word in a particular category? Um, we actually did that in collaboration with each other. Um, if we came across a word, one of the words that we came across was um, I want to say calmness, um, in a sense where, where would that go? Some people think calm as a positive word, but as we each had our own view of what that word means to us, I mean, you know, there are some issues with, you know, putting our own bias on, on the data, but being able to um, have an agreement between the three of us, that's really how we, we came up to the decision of how each word would fit into each group. And we also talk to students as well. So if we came across something and we were like, what did you mean by feeling this way? Do you, is that good for you? Is that bad for you? Is that a negative feeling, a positive feeling? And that kind of helped play as well. So we wanted to get it from the student's perspective. It's the word interested, I thought, was in the yeah. neutral category, for example. And nostalgia, which some people might say melancholy, sad, or it could be taken a lot of ways. So right. that's, it's good because it sounded like the three of you hinted at it in your, perhaps in your limitations. What do you think like, the potential is for people feeling pressure to put in emotion and they didn't really have much of an emotional reaction to that? I think that that was one of the um, suggestions that we had for um, future directions that this uh, study could go in. By having a word bank, you have a neutral word to say, I didn't really feel anything in this place. Like, um, being pressured to come up off the top of your head with an emotion when I'm quite sure that everybody was feeling all kinds of emotions just because of the amount of stress. <laughs> I didn't want to use that word, but stress <laughs> that we were all under. And I think, I think the fact that we had those five places that we had to visit, and then we were supposed to take, pick, sorry, pick ten places that meant something to us. So those were supposed to be the places where you didn't just see school and write down that. If that didn't mean anything to you, you didn't have to put down that point. So those 10 other places kind of gave us leniency to pick which places actually meant something to us. Well, thank you all. I think uh, well done. And now we'll move on to the second group uh, presentation. For anybody who has arrived late or is getting a little bit hungry after that word was placed up there continuously, uh, please, please go and grab yourself something to drink or eat. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, and I'm going to talk to you with my colleagues here about trash. So today we're going to be discussing um, mapping patterns of marine debris and key caulker beliefs. So key caulker is 
a rather small um, island right off the coast of Belize. And one of their biggest infrastructural issues is they have a major problem with um, trash, garbage, etc. either washing in on the island, being dumped where it doesn't belong, being dropped by tourists, etc. So one of the things that we did while we were in Belize was work with the Ocean Academy students to map patterns of trash on the island. So some of our essential research questions were, where are the highest concentrations of marine debris on Key Falker? What types of debris occur the most often? And what do locals and tourists on the island feel can be done to ultimately eradicate marine debris entirely? So a little background on sort of the formation of this study. So as um, Dr. Hawthorne and Dr. Basaji mentioned earlier, um, Paulita Bennett Martin, who um, just graduated and is a geosciences and honors student um, at Georgia State, did her honors thesis research and um, she went to Key Calker. She, she went to three other locations as well while she was um, in Belize. She stayed there for a month and she worked on mapping marine debris. So her honors thesis and her research served as sort of a baseline understanding of us sort of continuing the model that she helped create. So we worked off of what she was doing and joined up with the um, Ocean Academy students, which is a secondary school on the island. So we were working with students ranged from 12 to 14 years old and teaching them the GPS technology, having them come along with us, help us collect the data, and et cetera. So, and then past that, we um, collected the data and consolidated it into a database. So the purpose of the wider project, as I said, is to sort of establish a baseline understanding of the marine debris on the island. So we needed to understand the concentrations of it, obviously, to figure out which, the mo which areas are the most problematic on the island, as well as understanding which types of debris occur the most often. It's really important to understand if plastic bottles are the most significant source of debris, or if it's, you know, cans or any other type of garbage that you could think of. And then it was also important for us to understand local perceptions. So obviously none of these problems can be solved simply by understanding sort of the how the trash looks. We can know that there's a lot of trash on this very specific segment of this island, but if we don't understand how the people that are, you know, constantly around the trash feel about it, feel can be done about it, what the solution should be, etc., it's not exactly beneficial. So we engaged in not just data collection, but also um, surveyed locals and tourists on the island to understand how they felt about the issue. And then past that, um, the ultimate goal is to support the Belizean community in creating strategies to ultimately eradicate the debris. Right. Okay, so for collecting the data, we split up into six different groups. Uh, there was uh, two people from our program who were partnered up with high school students uh, in groups of uh, two to four students. And uh, we basically went along and collected GPS points at these sites. Uh, there happened to be a variety of different methods that were applied to this project. Uh, there was some problems with understanding the directions initially and um, how to actually go about collecting the data. Uh, some groups uh, basically just uh, GPS transects and then counted the number pieces of trash and different types of trash and recorded the material type and everything in that transect and then uh, thought we were compiling it to basically reflect uh, just the percentages of trash along these transects. Um, other people were collecting GPS points at every single individual um, piece of uh, refuse that they found and recorded exactly what that was. Um, some people did a combination of the two or a different variety on that. And so one of the main problems with this was actually uh, understanding the initial methodology of the data collection. Um, we also collected surveys in which uh, each group was tasked with finding some locals or tourists on the island who basically were asked a series of questions to get their feelings on uh, the source of the material and um, you know, what their perceptions of like, where it came from what uh, is the main reason that all this trash is laying around the island, and, and then how they felt about that. This map shows where the groups were located. 
throughout the island. So there were three groups at the northern part, which is where more of the tourists were, and then also two groups at the southern part where our hotel was located. We also took points for the locations of the trash cans. There weren't very many of them, which we thought could be a part of why there's such a big problem with all of this debris. Yeah, and there's also on this map, there's a location for the garbage dump. Um, in the garbage dump, they charge kind of an excessive fee, which is a deterrent for most of the locals to bring their garbage there, and that's how a lot of it ends up uh, just being dumped in the streets. In the middle of the island, there's uh, some locations where it literally looks like a garbage dump because a lot of the locals just continually dump their garbage there rather than going to pay the fee at the dump. Yeah, Leah and I were actually engaged in mapping the trash that on the street that led up to the dump, and uh, almost everyone that we surveyed on that particular road you know, I would point to a pile of trash nearby and sort of ask for their perception on that. And the first thing they would say is, well, the dump costs money and this doesn't. And so it became an issue of, it was almost, I mean, it was more desirable for them to pollute their home than to have to fork out that additional money to put the trash where it belonged, which was, you know, clearly a problematic infrastructural issue. <laughs> um, so... Using GIS on this project, um, one of the biggest issues was actually standardizing the data. And it took us a number of days, actually, to be able to figure out a methodology for crunching the data and being able to make it presentable using GIS. Um, what we ended up doing is we decided that the only way that we could actually do this since uh, one of the sites didn't collect data for each uh, individual piece of refuse, uh, which basically eliminated the probability of doing heat mapping or something of that effect, was to create polygons uh, and transects for each of the sites. And this had to be done basically arbitrarily. Uh, just we couldn't pace it out. We couldn't get the GPS point, so we had to kind of select randomly how to draw these polygons. Um, but that was the only way that we could actually consolidate the data to make it representable um, throughout all of the different sites. Um, and so what we ended up doing was we, we basically created a number for each transect and we had a total of 39 transects on the island in which we um, broke it down and did counts of the uh, different types of material that were found in the site. So there was metal, plastic, styrofoam, um, fishing material and, and then an other category for, for random stuff. And what we ended up doing was basically doing a percentage count for each of the transects and represented that with uh, pie charts on maps. We did face a lot of challenges in that every group interpreted the instructions a little bit differently, so it was hard to make it all uniform. But we were able to do that by, as you said, making the transects and then doing percentage. This map here shows how useful GIS is in showing the relationships between different attributes of the data we collected. So it shows not only the location of where the debris was, but also the material that was found there and the volume of it, which is the sizes of the pie charts. Um, so then what we did was we decided we wanted to look at the different areas, the northern and the southern sites on the island. Um, we found that there was actually a uh, significant difference in the distribution of the material types between the north and the southern end. Uh, in the northern end, you had a lot of metal. Uh, we're thinking the primary reason behind this, um, from the data collected, is that uh, there's a bar at the end of the island that's also the primary swimming area. And so a lot of the tourists end up hanging out in that area or drinking uh, metal bottle caps, end up getting popped off beers, and end up all over the beach in that area. I'm not sure how much the, um, the lazy lizard does for cleaning up uh, the refuse at the end of the day, but there are a lot of tourists there every single day, and so there's uh, you know, definitely a chance for a uh, high volume of garbage, in particular the beer bottle caps, to end up in the, in the sand there. Um, there also was a significant amount of plastic, but uh, the dominant material on the northern end happened to be metal. This shows the southern locations that we took data at. It shows a lot more plastic. And actually, the only two instances of fishing material that we found were in the southern portion. So that's giving you something about the docks here that people are fishing off of. And there seems to be a greater volume of 
debris in general in the South, and definitely more plastic. So to do a more qualitative analysis of the data we collected, we surveyed locals and tourists to get a wider range of responses, and we asked them what's most important to them when talking about marine debris. And the most common answer was biodiversity. The reef means a lot to everyone who lives there and it visits there. <coughs> it protects them from natural disasters and erosion, and also it draws a lot of tourism. So that was a, a big issue. Also, public health, aesthetics and social pride, tourism and economy were important to them as well. We also asked them what are the best ways to eradicate marine debris, and the answers to this were more varied from youth education, public awareness, public art installations, local law and policy. I know that when we were serving people, um, like I said, Leah and I were on a street, so we had a lot of people passing by us, so we had the opportunity to take the most survey data. And it seemed that um, older people generally really thought that youth education was important. Um, and then younger people tended to say that local law and policy was the most important. So it's sort of interesting to see generally, generationally how um, perceptions change across time of how people think these issues can be solved. But obviously, um, the reef turned out to be the biggest concern for everyone. And it's definitely the thing being the most affected, I would argue, as well by the debris. Yeah, another uh, interesting thing was um, asking uh, individuals where they thought this material was being sourced from. And you'd hear everything from the United States to Guatemala to the mainland. Uh, but what was kind of surprising was how many people were blaming the locals, which obviously was a major um, contributor to uh, the, the debris problem on the island. Um, especially when you're talking more of the actual debris in the interior of the island versus the potential of marine debris. Uh, but what I noticed, at least from uh, the site that I was working at, most of the material uh, that we were finding was from Bellican beer, uh, crystal water, and uh, things of that nature, which are definitely Belizean products sold right there on the island. So don't know for sure if they're sourced uh, primarily from the island, but it's definitely Belizean products, and the Belizean products aren't sold elsewhere for the most part. So it definitely indicative of it being uh, at least locally sourced, if not from the locals, um, tourism, something of that nature. And I know we want to give a big shout out to the Ocean Academy students who worked with us on this project. They were some of the most perceptive, intelligent kids I think most of us had ever met. They, you know, we could ask them, they, they already knew they could define marine debris before we even explained to them what it was, and then past that, we would ask them, you know, what sort of problems is marine debris causing in your home? And it was immediate firing off of, well, the coral reef is suffering, you know, the fish, the, the animals are being hurt, the tourists don't like looking at it, we don't like looking at it. They had this just really keen, profound understanding of these issues, which really helped us, I think, with our enthusiasm towards the project, as well as sort of establishing our conclusions, ultimately, because it, it's different when you're you know, talking to locals who are so affected by an issue and you realize you sort of have the power to potentially help shape the future of that issue. So it was really a great experience. So Ocean Academy, if you're watching, thank you. You guys were awesome. Any questions? <laughs> you have a question? <laughs> so given what you learned, um, from surveying people on the island, the data you collected, and quantifying the distribution of the trash that you saw, either along the street, the receptacles, or the debris on the shoreline, what do you think could be some recommendations moving forward immediately in terms of what they need to do to help address this problem? So either, you know, kind of easy quick things or more long-term strategies that might just be a step in the right direction? I think the quickest thing that could be done is installation of more trash cans. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we were mapping the trash cans, it was the most exhausting part of the entire data collection because we were walking, it felt like, you know, an 
miles in between trash cans. It was so difficult to find them, and which is a weird thing to explain if you, you know, didn't actually experience it, but we would be on these roads that stretched almost the entire length of the island, and there would be maybe two trash cans on the entire road, and so any sort of ability, and everyone walks everywhere on this island. It's not like people are driving, and so you pull up in front of the Walmart, and you throw away the trash in your car. It's not the same sort of experience. It's people are going into the convenience stores and walking, you know, the length of the island to their home, and if they finish their candy bar or something in that amount of time, the statistical chance of them even encountering a trash can during that journey is pretty small. So, I mean, I think that would be the quickest, like, the quickest fix to start remedying the issue. Yeah. Um, I also think if the, most of the trash cans actually were donated by people uh, or their uh, businesses put them out there. It's not actually the municipality, uh, Key Cocker, or any government officials that are being involved in, in this. And so I think um, some policies towards um, maybe making it more beneficial to use the dump, um, of course, installing many more trash cans. Uh, also, with the trash cans, the majority of them are little buckets on poles on the side of the road, and you can miss them if you're not looking for it. So. Um, there's only a couple of actually large garbage cans, uh, and the ones in the southern end, if you weren't looking for them again, you were not going to see them because they were kind of built into, I didn't, I didn't even see them, I can't remember who was telling me about them, but they were built into like a wood box, basically, yeah, with a lid on it, so you couldn't even see that it was a trash can, it wasn't marked as, you know, garbage receptacle or anything, so, um, there's definitely things I think that could be done, uh, you know, right now to basically help start stemming the problem, and that would be, of course, the installation of more trash receptacles, um, the government making it more um, beneficial for the people to actually use dump rather than just dump on the side of the roads. And then, yeah, of course, uh, long-term strategy, you know, is always reach the youth and get them interested in preserving uh, their natural habitats and not polluting. Isn't, isn't the most obvious policy prescription having a recycling program is there a recycling program? So when I lived there in 2007, there was no recycling other than of glass bottles, which were basically uh, just you had a deposit system with them, and they would go back, get washed out, and reused, um, which I'm still a fan of. I noticed that that wasn't as um, common this time around, uh, or at least people weren't being informed about uh, the recycling problem from the uh, bottles, and a lot of the glass bottles were ending up in the trash. Um, other than that, I, talking with some locals, I found that they, that some of the cities were starting to actually develop recycling programs, um, which I, you know, think are, is a very attractive idea, um, but they don't have necessarily the infrastructure or the budget to run that at the municipal level, and so I'm not sure if that is something that is viable as like a, a quick fix, but in a long-term solution, obviously, that would be something you want to look at. I was thinking of the recycling program that you bring the bottle in and get like 10, 15, 20 cents or things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because that would reverse the economic incentive. I'm just, I was just, I'm just curious though. Like, you know, yeah, like I said, in 2007, that was much more common. So. And would, um, again, just a uh, policy prescription, do you think that if, 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 oh, believe me, if, they, if they had certain days where there was no charge to bring it to the dump, okay, which, uh, uh, would that change the I tried to answer, I'm just saying bring this to the yeah. Well, we were we were asking people that. I specifically asked someone why why is it that they charge and it didn't seem that I mean I never really found the answer. I guess I could have maybe done some heavier like internet research, but even then I don't know if I would have found the answer. Mm -hmm. And um but it was, I mean, it was definitely the most resounding sort of reason why people were sort of just discreetly dumping their garbage wherever yeah. they could find it. And I, I cannot even explain. I wish I, we had pictures of the road leading up to the dump. It was just massive piles of trash. And, you know, the students at Ocean Academy were working on projects to, you know, put up signs that said no dumping, and they'd go out there and pick up the trash. And, you know, there's, there's efforts happening on a very local sort of individualized level. But it's not sustainable. I mean, it's every time they fix a problem, it reoccurs. And so. Yeah, and it's, and it's actually kind of a nationwide problem down there. 
Um, on the public transit, I remember back when I used to ride it all the time, uh, every, every stop that you make in the city along the way, people buy things from the vendors, and then when they're riding along on the highway and they finish their stuff, they just open the window and toss it out. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's part of the culture there, and it's ingrained. And so, um, obviously, some policy initiatives have to be put in place to try to stem the problem. Uh, but yeah, you, you, you got to start actually changing the culture and you know, I don't know exactly how to do that very easily. As an avid recycler, it was killing me like how many <laughs> plastic bottles and things <laughs> like that we were throwing away. Every single time we would leave a hotel and I would throw the bottles away, it was just killing me. Especially after doing this project, you just felt like such a horrible human being <laughs> continuing to contribute to it, but there really was, I mean, no other alternative other than putting them in my suitcase and physically bringing them back to America to recycle them. So. Can you think of any, uh, well, when you said you had to change the culture, I, I'm sitting over here thinking about social norms, right? Mm -hmm. And can you think of any recent uh, social norms that have changed in our country? You can think about that approach and how you could use that approach. Georgia State actually has a really interesting model for dealing with recycling. I mean, obviously, it's not difficult at all to find access to a recycling, you know, bin of any sort while you're on campus. But they also, they have their program where, if, you know, they have people walking around, and if they see you recycling, they'll hand you a coupon to the dining hall, like, oh, I saw you recycling. Here's, you know, some surprise incentive for what you just did. And it's sort of, I mean, it's been, it's kind of trendy now, even. I mean, it's, you know, who's going to be the person that throws away a plastic bottle in the trash can at Georgia State? Like, we don't do that around here because it's just sort of a, I mean, it's kind of our culture. Like, I, I don't know, I don't really know why, <laughs> but it is, you know. You know, it's, it's a progression in, in society where, you know, more it's appealing to more people, and then, there's, you know, you when you can start seeing the benefits, obviously, that's when it becomes something that, you know, starts becoming trendy or, uh, you know, popular within the culture. Uh, but, I mean, one of the main issues there is the, the drinking water. Nobody trusts the, the tap water. And if you taste it, it's not very good. It's very chlorinated. And, um, and then, you know, there's still this perception of you can get sick from drinking the water. Don't do it. Um, I haven't gotten sick from drinking the water there that I know of. But, uh, but yeah, it, it, like, you know, here I use, you know, a refillable bottle and, and I always am pretty primarily using tap water. I don't like, you know, drinking plastic bottled water at all. Um, but down in Belize, that's where almost all of your drinking water comes from. It's either going to be in a plastic bottle or in a plastic bag. And, or in the big. Or in the big five-gallon jug jugs, yeah. yeah. And so um, you have a much bigger issue with, a much higher percentage of the population that is fixed, fixated on drinking out of water out of plastic. And so that's one of the main contributors to the problem. Yeah. Yeah, is there anything that the government is interested in? I mean, there are lots of reasons why. Um, one of the things that the government would be interested in is tourism, um, the needs, et cetera. So, yeah, obviously, the things that the government is um, the government, I, I, we didn't really interact that much with government officials, but from my previous experience uh, down there and doing this, um, if it's advantageous for the government to act like they care, they act like they care. Um, do they really? My feeling from my previous interactions with them was not really. The locals, they really do care, um, when you, especially when you're dealing with uh, smaller uh, towns. Um, you get a lot of people who really care about the issue. Uh, when I was down there in 2007, I was working on a hydrogeologic study with the village of Sakuts. Um, they had put a hydroelectric dam up uh, in the, on the river in the mountains, and at, uh, prior to doing that, the river was crystal clear. Everybody liked it. It, it looked, you know, very pristine, a lot of uh, uh, biodiversity in it. After they put the dam, the sediment loads increased, and it basically turned it into a murky brown water. 
people didn't even want to fish out of it anymore. They didn't trust it for agriculture. And, and so we did water quality studies and give a presentation to the village of Sukuts on the water quality is sufficient for agricultural purposes and with some filtration can be used for drinking water even. Um, and I don't know how much they, they trust, you know, the, the American coming in and telling them that everything was fine. Um, but they, went, from talking with them, they basically were just told to deal with it by the government. The government did nothing to help reassure them or anything to try to clean up the water or help them in um, with any type of filtration system or anything. So there's a lot of distrust of the government by the locals in Belize. Uh, there, there is a fair amount of corruption. Uh, there's, you know, a very consolidated power group there that ma basically makes all of the decisions. And they even kind of, you know, have ways of getting certain officials elected or reelected. And so it, it's a, it, there's a major power play going on where the locals feel like they don't have any say in the government. So I don't know exactly whether the government cares or not. Yeah. Yeah, and Ocean Academy yeah, does that. That's kind of what's happening in homes like that. Yeah, so Ocean Academy uh, is, is basically, you know, recently started uh, not-for-profit uh, education, uh, secondary educational school, and um, they are really focused on place-based and skill-based learning and community involvement. And so uh, they have previously done um, days where they went out and cleaned up the uh, debris lane around Key Cocker. And this is something that they're going to continue with. And so I think if you uh, can reach, you know, the primary and secondary schools uh, and get them involved with the community effort to clean up the stuff around the whole entire country, I think that will be one of a big step in moving forward with that as well. So um, great presentation. Um, I wanted to I wanted to point out something that I think uh, I'm just so sad you didn't do, but like there's a lot of there's a lot of really good pictures of the collaboration with the Ocean Academy students, and I wanted to point that out first and foremost because that was amazing. Like hearing from basically all 12 of you of like the experience of working with these kids. I know you alluded to that at the beginning. Um, I wanted you to sort of talk a little bit more about the students from Ocean Academy working with you in the actual data collection process. And you can sort of talk about that experience, what you think it might have meant to them, what you heard from them, particularly in relation to using the technology and doing, you know, citizen science out in the field. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, they were so excited. And like I said, they were so perceptive. And they already had an understanding. I mean, I, I guess I went in imagining that we were going to be teaching them about something, but it was complete opposite. I mean, I was asking them so many questions as we were walking through, um, picking up the trash and taking our points and everything. And, you know, one of the kids was telling me that, you know, a lot of his friends litter and that, you know, a lot of kids, like, don't understand that he felt like he understood. And it was really, you know, it was sweet to hear them talking about it. But in addition, I mean, like I said, they gave me a real sense that the youth outreach is definitely, as so many people on the island seem to believe, is the key to this issue because they, once they get it, it's clear to them, it, it was clear to us how important it was to them and they, I mean, they understood better than we did what could be done to solve it, I think. Also, using the GPS to take points and coding all the data they picked up on really fast, so they ended up being really helpful with our data collection. Yeah, uh, and it, it with our group, at least, uh, there was a little uh, process of getting them out of their shell to be comfortable with us. Um, but once we were able to do that and, you know, got them out there laughing and, and participating, you know, they opened up, like, really quickly. Um, you know, we had one student who, who was first tasked with um, using the GPS and following and leading us to the site where we were collecting it. And he kept wanting to hand it off. He didn't want to do that. And then... And then uh, at one point he switched to uh, basically holding the garbage bag and, you know, uh, picking up some of the trash and, and he made a comment about, like, people are going to think I'm a criminal that's being forced out here to do this. And, uh, but then when he got on to actually recording the data on the chart, he, he took some of the best notes that we had out of the whole entire group and he seemed to be very pleased with that job. Um, it was interesting watching him, like, the apprehension with learning uh, how to use the GPS and everything. 
but as they you know got more comfortable with it and got more comfortable with us I think it, it really progressed throughout the day and was uh, very fun. Awesome. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna close us and let us sort of here. <laughs> we need to move on and uh, you guys did great. I'm glad we stimulated a lot of discussion. So I just wanted to add in a few quick comments based on some of your questions uh, for those folks who haven't been to Keep Talker. I think this uh, particular project, and of course I'm biased that I'm one of the people leading it, but uh, it's really unique because it really does bring geography um, to the very heart of the issue. You know, we have a local problem with not enough infrastructure for the um, disposal of trash and recycling on the island. The island is very small. There's only about 1,300 people there. It's only accessible by water taxi. There's no cars. You move around by golf carts and walks. Um, and it's less populated, or it's less frequently visited compared to some of the other really more economically important tourist islands that might get more money from um, the mainland government. So the folks within Kipagar, a lot of those families have been there historically for a long time, and they, in combination with the Village Council and Ocean Academy, have really done a great job of trying to address this issue with the funds that they Many of the receptacles that are there are just because the people want to have their stretch of uh, you know, street cleaned up and they want to help uh, address the, the issue. But as uh, our folks said, it is not just a local problem. Also on Peacock, they've experienced huge uh, influxes of debris coming in from cruise ships or wherever elsewhere in the current. And so, Paulita did a really great job in her thesis of looking at the recycling and uh, trash infrastructure in general there and the kinds of recommendations that could be made moving forward. Having data like this to present to the village council and to other levels of government higher up, I think will be really useful moving forward as we also continue to do this collaboration and see kind of what changes are made over the years. So. Thank you guys. eco-conscious tourism along the Belize Barrier Reef. The kayak mappers. I thought we were team rice and beans. Team rice and beans, sorry. <laughs> 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 oh, <laughs> and please get drinks and snacks. Is it okay if I stand over here? No, you're out of the camera chat. I don't have to take it. Yeah, it's Jason. Like, you're sitting here. I know, but he's like, I can't take it. Hi, everyone. Thank you for not liking them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I feel like I've never been in a podcast. Take it away. All right, so we're here for um, to present to you our, our, um, re our research project for today. It's the Eco Conscious Tourism on the Reef in Southwater Key Belize. I'm Grace. This is Johnny, and Kim is not in camera view right now. Hello. <laughs> All right, so our motivation for doing this project was to um, find ways to sustain tourism in the, in the island of Southwater Key. And Southwater Key is a very small island. It's just, it just has three resorts, three main resorts that just have locations there with some private residencies. Beautiful beach, crystal clear, and the reef is right there, so it's very easy to see. Um, to examine marine diversity, to go see what different types of corals and fish were living in that part of the reef, and to broaden our horizons on uh, coral reef preservation. And this is just a sponge. It's a picture of some is this a sponge? <laughs> a yeah, I believe it's a sponge. It's a cute little sponge. Thanks, SpongeBob. <laughs> All right, so the importance of coral reefs to Belize. Um, we have three different sections on here, but first let's talk about how the locals feel about the reefs. Um, the reefs, or the ecotourism due to the reefs, accounts for 30% of the country's gross income. So this is very important to uh, the locals, that people are coming to see the reefs. But of course they need to be maintained in their pristine form for people to keep coming to see them. 
Um, they're beautiful, and they're the second largest in the world. Um, and also, they feel that the reefs help protect them from large waves and hurricanes. Um, how do tourists feel about the reefs? Again, tourists want to see reefs in their most pristine state, which is why they come to the reef. Um, last but not least, we need to account for the fish that do um, their habitats are here in the reef. Um, they have protection from predators, and they do tend to reproduce them. They'll get their eggs, and they'll come back and nurse their baby, not nurse their babies, but <laughs> they'll check on their <laughs> eggs, etc. Um, we found this from the Dietrich, um, a 2007 article. And how does tourism affect the reef? Unplanned tourism, so people just decide, oh, let's take a random trip out to the ocean. Let's go a boat. We don't know where to go, uh, where there might be a large amount of coral. Let's just go right into the ocean. So they might take bottle caps, uh, bottles, Bella can beer out there, have a good time in the middle of the ocean, and they'll just toss it all into the water. Little do they know, they could break off a piece of coral, right? Um, direct contact of tourists, so maybe they're snorkeling. And I know when we were snorkeling in uh, Key Cocker, one of our problems was we would drift off and we would almost hit a coral, so if we would have hit it, we could have broke it off. But um, they don't know that, maybe they don't know they don't need to touch the coral or what safe, where the safe zones are. Um, anchor damage, they'll just park their boat anywhere they want. And sedimentation from coastal erosion. Um, the fact that the coral reefs down in Belize are mostly untouched, they're popular, but eventually people will decide to go more and more, and more people will show up to these places, and it'll be more than what the reefs can handle, and it will eventually destroy their natural cultural resources. And also, tourism can be a vehicle for conservation if planned accordingly. Okay, uh, why should we focus on coral reef preservation? Debris can physically damage the shoreline. So ropes, nets, and et cetera can scour or break the fragile reefs that are in the ocean. They float right off. They're dropped off the boats. People, they'll, you know, totally abandon their fishing projects, and the nets will float off. Um, we, they also feel that the reefs can protect against hurricanes and strong waves, as mentioned in the previous slide. Reefs help to change CO2 into oxygen, and if this stops happening, every life form on Earth will be affected. And fish use the reef for protection and reproduction purposes. Okay, so there are three organizations that um, we're primarily working with or are interested in coral reef preservation. Um, the first one is uh, Reef Project, which stands for the Reef Environmental Education Foundation. And they're just, it's a community group of scientists and just uh, diving enthusiasts that go and try to map, um, try to collect data on different biodiversity and diversity in the region, um, in different reef regions. And so the reason why we did this, uh, why we were in Software Key, is that there's not that much data there. So we're, we went there to see, collect data, and add to their database to help build it. And another organization was the Environmental Research Institute. And they're created to primarily address the large gap between local and the local capacity for researching and monitoring um, just Belize's core population. And they're focused on producing results that help um, to help find programs to sustainably um, allow that allow for reefs to be sustainably used and for tourism to work well. And the other organization is BIRDS, but we can eat, Biodiversity Environmental Resource uh, Data System Belize. And they just compile databases that have all the biodiversity of Belize. And so that's also we'll try and help and get some data on their environment and different types of animals and fish that live there. Okay, so this is um, a couple of examples of what we saw under the sea. Uh, we saw parrotfish. It's a vulnerable species in the coral reef. They're important because they, um, I, don't, I was, re we were reading about it and they are able to digest, I think, the grass in the, in the reef area and they, their waste becomes part of the sand and the fish poop that we're <laughs> doing it. <laughs> but it also, but that's what, that's what helps, um, those are nutrients for other organisms um, in the ocean. Um, 
Uh, we saw a couple spotted eagle rays. They're really cool and they're very distinct for their uh, markings. There are some sergeant majors and they're known for their stripes. Angel fishes look like angels to some people. I don't see it, but it's there. <laughs> uh, queen triggerfish is also, um, I think it's a, it's a vulnerable species as well. Um, we saw we saw a couple of them. Um, they I think they're they're um, fished over. They're part of the um, people aren't supposed to fish them, but they do anyway. And that 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 that's why they're a vulnerable species. Um, groupers are like the big giant under the sea. We saw one or two of them. And then the surgeon fish. They're um, they're like bright. And their shape is very peculiar. And then we have an we have examples of some of the. Uh, Reefs we saw, like fire coral. Um, I know that's that's important to kind of know because you want to stay clear of that because you don't want to touch that kind of coral. It'll cause inflammation. There's a soft coral, which um, are usually only found in calmer waters, but we saw a couple of them. Um, the staghorn and the elkhorn corals. Those are the ones that are. Um, I think they're endangered species of coral because with fluctuating temperature changes in the ocean, that ends up um, causing things like white band disease or um, coral bleaching and that causes the coral to stop growing so we don't really have that's why they're disappearing and then algae overgrowth I think that has to do with uh, when they overgrow on the coral like the coral can't grow anymore and that's the uh, growth and then there's uh, brain coral and star coral and brain looks like a brain and stars look like stars <laughs> So our research question uh, is, where should areas of tourism be focused to best preserve the reef? All right, so how does GIS help in the preservation of reefs and fish? Uh, we use the GPS to mark points where there are maybe large fish populations, small fish populations, etc. Also, we map out where the healthy versus diseased coral are and anything else we might see. So maybe we'll say, hey, there's a large population of swimmers here. Why? Let's go over here and check it out. Um, this raw data can be analyzed and it can be correlated to the causes. So, for an example, a research question may say, does tourism affect the amount of healthy coral? This can be answered with GIS by going out and taking those points in the water and then mapping out where there are healthy and diseased coral and the amount of tourism in those areas. So we can go to the state or the uh, government officials and find out how much tourism they get during certain months of the year and map that out with the coral and the diseased coral that we see. So our methods and analysis of the coral reef, um, how, we wanted to, how we wanted to collect the data was that we were separated into groups of, yeah, groups of four, um, three in each, and we would have one kayaker that would go and with the GPS to collect points because the GPS isn't waterproof, so you have to be careful with that. We would have two swimmers. Uh, one would take notes underwater and another would take pictures and they would relay data to the kayaker. So unfortunately, while we were actually collecting the data, um, the current right off soft water key was a bit too strong for most of the swimmers. So we only had the strongest swimmers go out and with maybe one or two kayakers to go collect data. And while they were collecting data, it, was, it proved very difficult to actually take notes underwater. While if you take notes, you have to stop swimming until you start drifting with the current. <laughs> and also take pictures. Well, since you have fish moving, it, it, it proves to be challenging. Okay. Um, we, we just listed the sources we were going to use because we're about to show you the, um, our analysis. Uh, we use a couple of RTIS online base maps as the base map <laughs> as, the, um, as the background for our analysis. And we wanted to credit our um, program for getting the points that we, we were a part of. And then reef, of course, where this is all going to eventually go towards. Um, and then these are just a couple other sources that we, we mentioned earlier on. And then um, we just wanted to bring up some of the processes we use in GIS. Um, we use buffers and intersects and some site suitability because we wanted to focus on on, um, on sustaining tourism in the area because we want to avoid disease um, corals. So that's why we use the methods we're about to show you, and then our map is the program and our catalog is where we are organizing our data because the grants eventually go into a reef organization program. So this is um, just the model builders we use. We um, let's see. So we use we use fish um, 
all the we separated all the points that we got into categories like fish, shark sightings, uh, where the diseased coral were observed and where the healthy coral were observed, and then we put some buffers around them. And then we wanted to see the areas that we wanted to avoid, and we also wanted to see the areas where you will get the most like viewing pleasure when you're snorkeling, like just the biggest chance of seeing like, oh, you want to see sharks, rays, fishes, stuff like that. So here's just uh, a reference map to find to show you guys how just how large the reef is. So all of this is the reef of Belize, and actually this is only half of Belize. Mm -hmm. This is the south part. There's the north part as well. I think the reef goes all the way up to the Yucatan to around perhaps Cancun. And so this is where we were in South Water Key, a very small island. And this is just to show the concentration of threat areas, which could be caused from overfishing, sedimentation, coral bleaching, development. And so South Water Key is between the edge of high and medium risk. And some very bad. Um, this shows the marine life and the abundance of marine life around South Florida Key. And uh, we mapped it out in single couple, few and many. Few indicates five to 10, and many indicates 11 to 99. Uh, this shows all the data collected and organized, and the fish are shown, of course, in the blue key points. So um, we had quite a few, or also shows the healthy coral, but we seem to have quite a few groups of many, and quite a few groups of fews of um, five to and these are just examples of other stuff you could see on your list view too. All right, so the safe zones for snorkeling. Well, they're not really safe zones, but what they are is the best places for tourists to go see the highest biodiversity, where the healthiest core are, with the most fish. And so well, you can see here, the optimal is in this fuchsia pink region. <laughs> so you can go and see in, the, in these areas, just the highest uh, parts of fish, where you can also avoid some diseased coral, and so you have the most viewing pleasure for your experience. It also try to minimize your impact on the actual entire reef. Um, and let me just point out these wonderful photos of us in our underwater gear. Um, of course, we've got our super fences here. Um, and a wonderful selfie taken under the water. <laughs> Okay, and then for this, I tried to use geostatistics to analyze where um, parrotfish was because it's a vulnerable, uh, vulnerable species. The problem with this is that uh, we only had a very limited amount of data points, so if that's one of the limitations of what we did. But if we had more to build upon, then this could be um, a very, very useful tool for seeing. Oh, parrotfish like to gather around here, and they don't like the other like certain other fishes. I think uh, sergeant majors were the ones that. Um, occurred most where they didn't want to, where the parrotfish didn't occur, so maybe that, there could be like, um, there could be like a competition, com or yeah, system. competition or like ecosystem reasons. Our intended audience, uh, of course we want to have these visible to the tourists with these maps. If these maps are posted all around coastal areas, maybe the, the swimmers will pay more attention to them before they walk out. Uh, maybe some analysis can be done with them. So we can actually draw some conclusions. Hey, do not go into this area. We can stick some flags out there. This is a this is a um, a, prote a protected zone. Don't go out here. Also, to the large companies, um, they need to know how their manufacturing affects the life in the ocean. We actually went to um, sugar cane factory while we were in the Orange Walk, and before they sent any of the water they used in their factory back out into the river, which streamed out into the ocean, um, they tested the pH levels of their water. And that was very important because if they would have just sent the water out there the way that they used it in the factory, they could have killed tons of sea life. So we definitely need to point that out to the large company. Um, conservationists, the Legion Authority, and the NGOs, and also uh, there might be a community need for a map so that the uh, tourists, I'm sorry, the tour guides know where to take the tourists and no areas to avoid. And also uh, the community can monitor areas for progression or diversion. And so our limitation of our work was that the fish were mobile and <laughs> they're better swimmers than us in any in any day. So especially with that current, it proved very it proved hard to keep up with them, take pictures, or just relay information back to the kayakers. Because he's like, hey, I'm over here, so the kayak would have to go against the current and then oh, to also take notes, and well, then they'd start falling back again. 
Our data was collected over two days at two different times because just the way the current was and the availability of our swimmers. And the prior knowledge people had of like what coral was what and what fish uh, was was which one was extremely important because if if you don't know I guess, what, what type of fish you're looking at or what type of coral, you can only collect so much data. And especially, and unfortunately our base map is very, it was limited because we would have preferred to use satellite imaging, especially in uh, Southwater Key. Unfortunately, the, it doesn't have, that area does not have the best satellite imagery. So we were just, we were uh, reduced to using just a, um, a biodiversity uh, 2D map. And then uh, for future directions, um, this, this kind of data can be expanded and it can also be, since it's going to go into a bigger, um, bigger set of data with reads, it can be expanded from year to year so you can see the progression of coral diseases or, or if it's stagnating in diseases, you can see what type of um, fish is more prominent from year to year or just, just the, um, keep track of like the general amount of the different populations in the species. And then you can also see like what parts of the reef fish would like to tend to gather on, like say they like this section near the fire coral, or not fire coral, but like back horn coral, or like finger coral, like see what's going on. Alright, so um, <laughs> the best way to answer our question from earlier is that we need to have preventative methods in place. Uh, by doing this research, we know where to take the tourists and where not to take the tourists. We can post maps and our research results. And hopefully they'll read them before they go out, and we can help to protect the healthy corals versus the diseased corals, so that the fish have a place to stay. Um, and keep in mind that our data, uh, because of the the current was so strong, and I will say a lot of us had a hard time out there. Some of us almost drowned, let's be <laughs> honest. But um, the data was not sufficient enough for the intended purpose. So we wanted to do a lot more with the data, but we definitely. Uh, we lack there because of the strong current and wind. Alright? Okay. Any questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, next presentation. So considering that you're probably always going to be worse swimming than the fish, <laughs> do you have any suggestions for future studies that might improve your data bank? Um, I would definitely suggest maybe a motorboat instead of a kayaker. Um, because the kayak was so light and it was it, it, it just floated away. So the motorboat following the swimmer around maybe and the swimmer stopping after they took some photos under the sea and gave the information to the person operating the motorboat. Can I, can I also add something to that one? Or I think um, a motorboat would be good if there was a lot of space but since the coral reef it's pretty, the area we were at, like there wasn't really space for a motorboat so I think that's why we used the kayak. Um, I think if the swimmer, uh, this might sound crazy, but if you kept the um, kayaker and the swimmer kind of together, and then when you wanted to go actual snorkeling and seeing and collecting data, maybe they would just drop, they would kind of like, see, they would like drop down from where the kayak was instead of the kayak coming to them, because then they would already be in the general vicinity, it wouldn't have to paddle over to this side, but like keep them closer together. And one way is just taking a stationary point, or staying at a stationary point, and just recording, okay, I see this many fish passing by, this is the, the coral, because the coral shouldn't be moving unless there's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> you see the coral, and you just, you know, you denotate what, co what coral you have there. And also, uh, maybe having an underwater GPS with a camera mm -hmm. would definitely help. What a wonderful segue into what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the, one of the highlights, you, you guys know this, right? One of the highlights I like to mention of this class, and I think it's really cool, in geosciences in general, is we have really awesome toys. Right. One of those awesome toys was our um, drone helicopter that allowed us to take some really awesome aerial shots over the reef, which I'll show you some later. But another thing that Dr. B and I are going to be buying um, with one of our smaller grants is an underwater drone as well. So allowing, you know, the motorboat idea is great, but kind of questionable in this particular area. But an underwater drone connecting to a GPS floating on a buoy above it can be really cool to do a lot of what you guys are talking about and eliminate the stress and fatigue of and things like that. So, for those listening online and archive footage, we have the best toys. You should join us in time. <laughs> um, do you think like there's potential that uh, maybe trying to create again like using transects and then 
like that way like the swimmer could have you know a chart of all like the different types of fish that you're expecting to see and then just keep tally counts for that transect you think that'd be a more beneficial method rather than trying to collect a point for where the fish are where they're obviously not going to be in 20 seconds or um you know just other methods that could potentially work oh well, yeah yeah creating just different zones the problem is just staying in those zones i mean it's, if the current's strong but yeah creating different zones and just having a uh, you know, monitoring monitoring system would be extremely useful. But there could also be a chance that fish could overlap transects. With, you know, they want to swim. They're not going to just sit around and wait for us to come take a picture of them. <laughs> yeah. um, first of all, you accomplished your goal, part of your goal already, because just raising awareness about uh, how to interact with the environment for someone who's going there next month. Now I have great information about what to do and what not to do, so I appreciate that. But I was thinking about the presentation and how, the, given the limitations, you wish you would go back, you could go back and you could do X, Y, and Z. Um, I just want to throw out this public service announcement. There is a way to go back and re-engage you know, the way that your professors will be doing over the years, but re-engage individually, which is through a Fulbright. And there's a particularly neat opportunity that Fulbright has which is called the National Geographic Digital Storytelling. So in keeping with that idea of a drone, maybe with your GoPro or something, um, there's a partnership between Fulbright and, and National Geographic where they really want students to go out and capture these stories that have to do with the environment, nature, fish, how to preserve it, what, are, what, can people, what should people know in order to conduct themselves accordingly. So that's an opportunity that's brand new, and uh, I'd be happy to share more information about anyone who's interested. Last PSA is I'm presenting some information on it today at noon, but I'm also presenting <laughs> June 6th at noon if anyone wants to know more about it. Oh, it's interesting you brought that up, Jennifer, especially with the drone thing. So many of you probably heard me and Dr. B co-lead the Georgia Geographic Alliance through National Geographic, and uh, one of the things they, they want is new, creative, innovative ideas, and um, a couple, about a month ago when I was meeting with their leadership at one of our national conferences, we talked about the drone stuff, we talked about Belize, we talked about what we do in Atlanta, and they went like insane. They were so excited about the possibilities. So I think, um, you know, if this is something somebody wants to think about, Dr. B and I can chat a little bit more. Um, the National Geographic's leadership is really, really excited about it as well, um, especially if we can connect international learning to what we do here in Georgia. Um, I also wanted to, I wanted to make a point about guys were saying about how tourists can use these maps. Um, you guys know this, but for those who weren't there, one of the real strengths of what we do is all of the maps are shared with our collaborators, both in an online format and in a, in a printed format. So the maps that have been created of the tourist zones around Southwater Key in previous years are hanging on the walls of the resorts that we stay at. And everyone, I mean, everyone is looking at these maps. Like they show where beginners, intermediate, advanced snorkelers can go. Your guys' maps are going to add to that as well. And our, um, our collaborators at that resort, the local tour guides, are psyched about that because they, they keep hearing back from local guests that they're just so excited to see that. They know where to go. They know where to avoid fire pearl, the grass that stings you, stuff like that um, as well. So I wanted to point that out. I think that's a, that's a really important thing. And also, it's, it's the number one beach in the world now as well. So having maps on the number one beach in the world is a pretty exciting thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and the final thing, sorry, I have to point out, in a complete moment of serendipity, the key right next to Southwater Key, Caribou Key, which is the host of the um, Smithsonian Field Research Station for the Belize Barrier Reef. So we take a tour there every year, and I took some awesome drone footage that we're going to create a map for the Smithsonian, put it on their website from SDSU. Uh, just so happened that the field manager for the month that we were there was a 1975 Georgia State alumni, which we had no idea this was going to happen. Total serendipity. Um, he was a bio bio major, yeah, bio, right? Yeah. Bio major from 1975. So again, just Panthers everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he um, is going to be watching the archive footage. He's traveling today, um, but he was really psyched to see Georgia State students there and um, wants to talk about ways to continue the partnership on the Smithsonian. So I think you guys did a great job with the challenges of field conditions for collecting lots of different types of data, but uh, 
think it's really commendable the, the types of research questions that you came up with for your math team, kind of trying to guide towards just to have a better enjoy and understand of these while I'm making sure that they're group here is going to talk to you about the sugarcane farming mapping. Uh, we have two of the three presenters. The third presenter, before he signed up for the class, he had already scheduled a personal trip. Um, so he has, he has completed a lot of the work as well. Um, just unfortunately, he cannot be here for today. He has an excused absence from being here due to his travel schedule. Good morning, everyone. I'm Heather Brissy, and I'm a geosciences major. And this is Babette Gadsden, and she's uh, getting her master's in anthropology. Um, for the past couple of weeks, we've been in Belize uh, collecting sugarcane data um, in order to use GIS to map the sugarcane agriculture in Orange Walk, Belize. Now, it's really important to understand why this carries so much weight in Belize. Um, the northern districts in Corozal and Orange Walk contain 40,000 people who are directly and indirectly reliant on the sugarcane industry in some way. That's 85% of the population up in those two districts. So in some way, like either they're the farmers themselves, there are 6,000 uh, individual farmers, or their families, their sons and daughters, uh, mothers and fathers. Um, then you have your transport, who transport the trucks and the sugarcane to the factories, your factory workers, who are uh, their processing the sugar into sh or the sugarcane into sugar. Um, and overall, the sugarcane industry makes up 60% of Belizean export agriculture. Once the sugarcane gets to the plant and it's begun its processing, uh, they end up creating white sugar, brown sugar, molasses, and electricity. Um, they actually produce uh, a very specific kind of brown sugar that's a, usual, a larger grain than all the other, um, and it's shipped specifically to England and only England. Um, and then as far as electricity goes, uh, they produce uh, 30 megawatts at the plant, which powers the plant and also covers 20% of Belize's uh, electricity intake. Um, another thing that is really important is uh, the sugar industry has a lot of national agreements with the United, Na United Nations, the EU, um, fair trade, the, whole, the entirety of Belize is all fair trade for sugar cane. Um, and they have to f fulfill a certain amount of quota. So they, ha they get preference on a global market. Um, they get set that um, they are going to be able to sell this much, even if they can't necessarily make uh, what is a globally competitive price. They are working on it, but it's not quite there yet. Okay, as far as the local context, uh, the sugarcane industry began after the caste war. Um, in 1847, immigrants came in and they started uh, planting sugarcane, initially for local consumption, and then by 10 years later, in uh, 1857, um, they started shipping it off to England. In the 1950s, uh, they were guaranteed a, a certain quota that they would be able to sell on the global market. And by the 20th century, sugarcane became the country's principal agricultural export. Um, from 2007 to 2010, the sugarcane industry had a really a few hard-hitting hardships. Um, there were hurricanes that came in late 2007 and again in 2010. Uh, they had particularly heavy rainy seasons, which caused a lot of flooding. It was difficult to get out to the fields and work them. It drowned out some, a lot of stuff. Um, there was decreased cane quality, so the cane would be more stale than what it should have been. So there was lower sucrose, so it wasn't as able to produce as much sugar per cane. Um, and then lastly, there was excess of mud in the producing plant. Um, so more time processing the sugarcane, trying to get the mud out, is going to end up equaling less dollars that they're able to make. Um, 
but by 2012, production began to see a rise by 12.5%. Uh, this is due to increased uh, farming um, knowledge, so they were able to use better varieties uh, that could produce more sucrose per amount of cane. Um, our port partner organizations that we worked with uh, was CRD, which is the Sugar Industry Research and Development Institute, uh, the Belize Sugar Industries, uh, BSI, and that is the only sugar processing plant in Belize, um, and the sugar cane farmers themselves. We met them out in their fields, we talked with them, and gathered data firsthand from the people who have been managing the farms for years. Uh, our, of our research questions, um, of the parcels that have been ground truth, so we went, broke up in small teams and we tried to, we, there we had data, we went to ground truth and say, okay, this is what is actually there. We've confirmed it, it's, that's what's there. Um, of those parcels, what is, what is the correct estimate of total acreage of the sugarcane parcels? How many people would be sufficient to map uh, grid 29, which was our area? And how many of the parcels were harvested in 2014? And then, in total, of all the parcels, ground truth or not, um, how many were harvested in 2014? Uh, the role of GIS, it's uh, basic and in-depth features organize and analyze the farm data to improve record keeping and assist in management decisions. So we are able to drop points, later go back and create polygons where the parcels were, uh, intersect polygons to break up parcels if there are multiple of what might have thought to have been just one, um, and then use model builder to conduct further analysis. Okay, so um, the materials that we used in this project were uh, included our GPS unit. Um, we also had um, Siri have provided um, large blow-up maps of each um, subgrid so we can take, um, make adjustments to and um, correct um, the parcel shapes on the actual paper. Um, we also had field notebooks, which um, we had uh, individuals that were tasked with collecting notes um, about the points we were taking. And we had, of course, writing utensils. Um, they also used Samsung Galaxy tablets, um, which we can digitally um, also make edits to um, the parcels of um, which represented the actual sugarcane farmland section. And um, we had they had satellite imagery um, for grid 29 and the subgrids within grid 29 loaded onto these galaxy tablets, which made it easy for us to actually um, see where we were um, in addition to having paper copies. We had digital copies, which were easy to load up as well. Um, and then we had vehicles. Um, and we used ArcGIS 7.1 software to input um, all of our information, our data. All right, so um, when we got to um, to Santa, um, to I'm sorry, Orange Walk, <laughs> um, we had um, CRD had given us a um, um, like a, we had a meeting with CRD and they were able to um, let us know what grid we were going to be working in, which is grid 29. And um, they had the, like I said, uh, had the Galaxy tablet set up with ArcGIS, um, also with the um, satellite imagery of the grid 29 where we would be working. They also had already identified their um, personnel um, and uh, identified their lead field officers and the data collectors, and it had already split up into nine different groups. Um, and they assigned um, each group to um, a different subgrid within grid 29. And like I said, mentioned, they um, had enlarged printed copies that were issued to each group. All right. so. Georgia State University students, as well as the um, University of Belize students, we were um, divided into each of these nine groups and um, put with the lead officer and data collectors. And um, during the meeting with CRD, they provided us with an overview of this pilot project that we were doing for them. 
um, in collaboration with them. And also um, within that, they gave us the five main attributes that we needed to collect um, while we were out in the field, which um, were the farmer's name, uh, the date the sugar cane was planted in the field, and the species or the variety, uh, the type of sugar cane that was planted there, the date it was harvested last, and the yield um, when it was harvested. And so we were, uh, as I mentioned, we were broken into nine different teams. Each team had about four to five people. Um, and um, we traveled to our uh, assigned group area. Uh, it was about seven o'clock in the morning when, when we um, started. And um, we stayed out to about 12 p.m. And um, um, we collected all the data from all the teams and um, we'll, as we were collecting data in the field, each team was tasked with, um, like I mentioned, adjusting the polygons to actually fit or um, illustrate what was actually on the field, uh, on the ground. We had to extend some polygons and cut some uh, in half or reduce some sizes because some sugarcane land was actually not sugarcane. It may have been another product or there may have been um, um, overgrowth or brush or something there instead of actual sugarcane fields. Um, so we updated these with the tablet and on paper and also by taking notes and using GPS points. And once we got back to the office, we were able to um, um, sync uh, and, and compile all the data from um, CRD and also from the GPS points that Georgia State University and uh, University of Louisiana had taken. Okay, so once we got gathered all the data, um, when we came back to Georgia State University, um, our group had to uh, meet with all the other groups that were collecting the data to try to make sense of the points and where new polygons needed to be um, adjusted, added, or um, modified. And um, um, with this, we also had to update our data, the database with um, uh, the additional information by updating the attributes and adding what parcel um, these new grids were, were coming from, who the farmer's names were, and things like that. Um, all the five attribute information that we mentioned earlier. Okay, so within um, ArcGIS, we built a, uh, a geo database where we can house all our files. Um, we inputted the GPS points, the grid, the grid 29 and then the subgrids within grid 29 that we were working in. And then we also had a image, uh, a copy of the, um, all of the, the polygons that were believed to be sugarcane farmland uh, in the total area of um, grid 29. And we, we updated the polygons um, uh, by adding, combining, or removing the um, parcels. And we entered, as I mentioned, all the attribute information on each parcel and uh, from what we could gather and created new um, feature classes which were um, how much which represented how much sugarcane was harvested in 2014 from the information we were able to gather and um, which parcels we were actually able to ground truth out of the whole entire um, grid of 29 subgrid 29. All right. So just to give you an idea where Orange Walk is so this is Belize, and this area would be uh, where Orange Rock is located. This is subgrid um, 29. This is, well, it's grid 29, and then you can see all the subgrids within uh, grid 29. Alright, so all of these um, kind of reddish colors are the total um, areas which we believe are sugar canes in uh, the entire area of, of grid 29. The yellow um, parcels are the sugar cane fields that we were actually able to get on the ground and confirm were sugar cane. And about, so we were able to cover about 22.6% of the entire grid from 7 a.m. to about 12 p.m.
from the um, area that um, that we're able to ground truth in in yellow, we were able to determine about um, about twenty twenty two um, percent was actually harvested. As far as we know, we weren't able to get all the harvest data because sometimes the farmers were not available um, to give us this information. So this is from what we actually were able to to collect and confirm. Um, but about 22% of what we covered was actually already harvested for the year 2014. Um, also from the information that we have from CRD and what we collected, um, this is what we can confirm uh, thus far that has in the entire grid that has been um, all the fields that have been harvested here in green, which is about um, about also 22%. So we wanted to look at um, other ways in which would be other um, questions that may be useful um, to help farmers and um, CRD with um, potentially with road networks and things like that and, and analyzing uh, better ways to analyze um, how um, they can look at yield and, and connection with um, crop yield and crop production in relation to road networks. Um, there was a study done in Africa in 2009 that um, was able to show that the further away um, croplands uh, were from road networks, there was a lower um, lower production, lower, uh, lower yield of crops. So um, we were not able to get the yield data. <laughs> so that's something that, um, this is just an example of a model of what could be done once uh, more data is, is collected and once um, um, some things are cleaned up, we would need to, to get a little bit more information and, and um, different attributes. But um, we did build a model for them so they can uh, potentially use once they have um, more uh, additional information. But basically what we did was we got the road network here in red and um, we took the um, total um, harvested fields, which, uh, um, and we, we um, recategorized them, so we like showed the density or the, um, the amount of, um, of um, acreage by color. So the darker the color, the more acres um, the parcel has, um, because we wanted to see, um, this is a way to find, uh, to visually see how close these are to the roads and things like that. So what we did is we put a buffer around the road. Um, we use a hypothetical 500 meter buffer um, around the road network to see of all of the the lands that the sugar land um, sugar cane land that was harvested in 2014. How much of that is within 500 meters of actual road network? Um, so we created a 500 meter buffer around the road, and then we intersected that with the um, sugarcane harvested later for 2014. And we were able to, to see, um, to, to intersect that with the buffer. And you can see all of the, the parcels that are within the 500 meter distance. And so this is a way that in the future, um, even on a larger scale, because they want to take this and look at it um, for the whole country. So this would be a way um, to look at um, you know, they can look at maybe one mile away, two miles, three miles, five miles. And by looking at the percent of um, yield within these, these um, buffer zones uh, by mile, they can see if there's a trend in, um, in distance from road network. It, is the yield getting, is it increasing? Is it not changing? Is it getting, um, is it decreasing? They see if they need to um, maybe make some different road connected um, road accessibility to, to lands that are not as close to parcels of um, sugar cane. And so this is the model that we used, basically the map that we just showed, the last two maps. This is the model um, that we use that we'll provide for them that they can use in the future. Um, and it shows the, the road, um, the buffer, and the intersect, and how you would go about um, 
um, the process of creating um, creating the map that we just presented. We had limitations. <laughs> um, some of the limitations that we came across was groups um, co collected data differently or didn't. <laughs> um, and so that was uh, a bit of a, a, an issue. Um, we also had um, feature class information uh, within the data um, that we were provided um, with some of the layers that we were provided from Sorority did not contain um, uh, some of the metadata, so we were limited on the analysis that we could do. Um, and, and the way some of the um, attribute uh, information was in, entered into the, the system um, was there was variable, so it would make it hard to do analysis. Um, also, um, some of our <laughs> um, teams gave their notes back to um, to the to CRD, so we were unable to um, look at some of the notes from field collection. But we were able to sit down with with different groups and um, try to make some sense out of things. But um, it it had been almost a week. <laughs> since then, so it was hard for some of them to remember exactly where they were at and, and things like that. So we also, of course, had time constraints. Um, this project, I think, needs a lot more time, especially with cleaning up um, attribute tables and databases. It, it, it took us two days, and we still need some things to, to look at. So it's a lot, a lot of time that goes into this. And uh, there was limitation as far as um, lim some limited knowledge on what um, GIS can do and the different analysis that we can do within groups. Some future um, directions, future questions um, that can be looked at is um, one that would be really interesting is to look at um, how much of the um, leftover sugar cane, once the sugar is extracted, how much of that um, is actually used to create electricity and bio, um, biofuels, um, how much is being produced from the sugar cane and, and that the farmers are supplying to the factory, and, and uh, how can they also get some kind of compensation or, or profit from this. Um, and also we can use soil data to, na to analyze if there's any relationships between soil degradation and sugar cane farms, where there are some farmers that are participating in um, burning of the fields after they harvest. Some farmers will burn the fields. Um, which after the first um, first time you harvest, you burn the field. That's recommended that that's enough. But some farmers continue to burn the field. Um, so it may be interesting to look at a correlation between yield and um, and uh, overlaid with these farms that are continuously burning the field. Um, we can also look at climate data in relation to sugarcane fields to analyze um, the climate and its potential or correlation to sugarcane quality, uh, also using maybe soil and climate to, um, to look at the relations between the amount of yield. experience because I wasn't in a group with you, but um, it was enjoyable. <laughs> um, in the field, I, I think maybe a challenge was the tablet, maybe like one of the University of Belize students suggested maybe having a drop down um, menu to kind of do some of the selections, but the um, tablet did seem to take a little bit longer. Also our GPS when I was trying to, maybe having a GPS were, I mean, screen or something or something like uh, a little bit easier to, to add notes in because I was a lot of times trailing behind because I was trying to put notes for each point that I was taking. So that was a challenge. 
to promote technology. Yeah, uh, same thing. The challenge was probably technology. Uh, some groups I heard back, maybe the tablet totally didn't work at all, so they just took notes because it wasn't working. And for other groups, luckily my own, everything kind of worked. So it was really nice because we could take our notes and we could put it in the tablet, and it was good. But uh, like I said, if you're having trouble, it was definitely a plus that we had uh, a hand chart that we could just write down if the technology wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So that's one big issue that some groups have. And enjoyable. Enjoyable. I personally really enjoyed being, you know, in the field, doing field work, talking with people who it's really important to. Like this is their livelihood. This is how they provide for their children. This is how they send them to school. This is how they put food on, on the table every night. And for a lot of them, this is what their families have been doing for a really long time. So it was good working with them and knowing that it was actually important. And it wasn't just something that was like, oh, yeah, we did this. It was, no, this could potentially have an actual impact. It's really showing something to an organization that can take it further and hopefully can take it further as well. On that note, I, I want to point out something. I think many of you heard this, but maybe some of you didn't. Um, one of the things that we're doing, we've been invited back to continue the collaboration. Um, they're really interested in bringing in two or three students and us as a, as faculty to come back in August and September for one to two months to continue this research and really expand upon the methodology that was developed by them and implemented with you and your group students. So uh, that's exciting because they want to co-fund it, which is great. <laughs> and it gets us back there uh, as well. But I think that really that really speaks to the idea of international collaboration and how, you know, basically they don't have a picture of this, but what's really cool is the morning of this happening, it was a convergence outside of the hotel, right? Us, UB students traveling three hours, leaving their hotel, or leaving campus at 3.45 in the morning to meet us. The farmer showing up, the, the research staff showing up, and then we just sort of disperse in the back of pickup trucks. Sorry, risk management people. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> zooming off to 15 different fields across the lead. Like, that, to me, is what is really powerful about this kind of experience, is that chaos and then somehow making it all work, even though you have to go and clean the data, and you know, the technology is going to break. The number one rule of the technology class is the technology is always going to break. <laughs> so you know, I think going through those conditions and that experience, that, that's really cool. And I think that's, that's one of the things that I want to point out about the class that makes what international research is really neat. OK, so that concludes the four presentations. So thank you, guys. Really, really briefly, in like five minutes, um, we just want to show a couple of the finer photos from this. And I apologize, the credits are from all of these students. We just sort of picked a few pictures. Uh, but here's what I'm talking about, right? Meeting outside the hotel for sugarcane mapping. Jessamine Ramos, the, the lead GIS person on the project from CIRTI. Uh, you know, uh, Melissa, one of the UB students, Denver, and then CIRTI staff and one of the local farmers talking about the project. Um, <laughs> um, they actually had big printed out aerial photos of each of the properties. So if the technology died, they had that. Field notes, right? Everybody's having a good time. And then, you know, again, the risk management stuff, driving in the back of pickup trucks throughout the city. But that was fun. <laughs> um, another point we talked about critical reflection and emotions and all that stuff. I mean, that I think is the most challenging part of this. It isn't the technology. It's dealing with all of the craziness and chaos of study abroad. And so this, <laughs> this was actually one of my most favorite moments. Um, we got to one of our destinations right before we did the mapping in Dangriga of Emotions. And I told them, go off, take 20 minutes with yourself and figure out like the three emotions that have dominated your thinking throughout this trip. And so everybody went and did their individual thing. Johnny here found the coolest spot up in a tree. Um, but, you know, just spent some time to sort of reflect on what they had been feeling for the first, what, eight, nine days of the trip, and then we sort of talked, and then they went out and did their mapping as well. And then this uh, was some of our work that we did in, in Key Cocker with Ocean Academy. Uh, we visited Ocean Academy, uh, worked on some lessons in the classroom, as well as the students joined us in the field for the collection of the marine debris data. And then we also went to the primary school to help recruit for Ocean Academy to make sure that those students were interested in continuing on their education by doing some 
interactive lessons with them, including creating a map of Belize and having each of the students contribute their ideas to places that they had been, and uh, using the drone as kind of a fun, cool toy to get them excited. Uh, we had all the students get together to make sure to wave to the drone, taking pictures from above. And then, uh, you know, we did some fun stuff too. It wasn't all work. Um, one of the coolest things, I think, uh, toward a uh, Mayan ruin, uh, Shinatsanich is one of the best ones right on the Belize Guatemala border. Um, climbed up to the top here as well, took some awesome photos. Um, but again, I think integrating that fun stuff into this trip is important as well. We went on some, uh, a jungle hike to one of the cave systems, ATM cave, uh, swam with sharks, swam with the rays, all that stuff. Again, apologies, risk management. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we should not show that one. <laughs> uh, so, you can't see his head, but this is at the Belize Zoo, which was one of the coolest places I've ever seen. You think of a zoo and you think of this giant caged electric fence thing, <laughs> not the Belize Zoo. The Belize Zoo, very, you know, very small fencing. Uh, the spider monkey exhibit, you can actually, like, spider monkeys will jump on you. I don't think that happened uh, this time, but that can happen. Birds will fly through. Um, here's an example of the jaguar cage, junior the jaguar. Um, there's actually a cage where tourists can get in, so our students got in and got to pet and feed the jaguar um, as well. Just a really cool experience um, learning about conservation as well. Um, here's the stuff, the, the prep work for the field work, kayaking and GPS data collection um, as well. And then finally the drone overhead. We've got some of the most incredible panoramic shots I've ever seen uh, of this reef that we're going to share with our partners as well from the drone. Um, so this is our classroom, right? This is, this is the opportunity that I think Study Abroad provides, and we're so excited to be a part of it. And I can honestly say without a doubt, this is the most exciting thing I get to do um, on campus. And that's not only because it's a beautiful place, but also because these people, like, they, they blow it out of the water. I mean, the amount of time they put into this, I always stress that it's a 16-week course in three weeks. We're working 16-hour days most days, if, if not more. Um, and then we come back here in complete chaos and try to do analysis and data cleaning in the span of three days. So I always tell them, you guys probably hate me when I say this, but like the three days of campus here is basically like the last month of campus for a regular semester. So the amount of work that these guys have been able to, to figure out in the span of three weeks is nothing short of phenomenal. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, as well. And then I wanted to point out as well, this is also pilot data, right? It's, you heard repeatedly of the idea of the future research directions. Their tasks were to, to sort of insert themselves into collaborative research projects and then pose new questions for further collaborations. And I think they've done a really good job of doing that while demonstrating their ability to use GIS software and field data collection to address their needs. And my final point about this is that the people in this room, the 12 students here, only two of them have had prior GIS experience. And think of what they were able to accomplish as introductory students. That is phenomenal. And so I, I really want to stress that, um, this interdisciplinary nature of being able to go out and do something with very limited knowledge of a software package that is incredibly difficult to learn. But these guys persevered through it, through lab exercises, through field work and I think created some really strong products. So I just wanted to applaud um, the students in the room for a great job. And our last slide here is an example of uh, one of our wonderful times in the field with our collaborators in Belize. Uh, Santos helped us really bridge the University of Belize connection last year with some of our farm mapping. And that is continuing to grow this year. So, uh, we're really excited to continue working with all of our partners in Belize. Thank you all that have been listening <laughs> or are going to be watching the archive footage. Um, for those of you here, the last thing I'll say is free lunch at noon. Um, we've got some sandwiches coming at noon. Um, for our guests in the room, you're welcome to join us to mingle and talk with the students a little bit more. Um, so we'll start that at noon and Kel 3.30 in our seminar room. So thank you all. Awesome work, everyone. Thank you, I guess, for coming.